Just like the passing of seasons and the absolute certainty of death and taxes, yeah, I know we're starting this in such a joyous place, there are cycles to the world's economy. The exhilaration of a bullish market where investment flows into property and stocks and companies like it's coming from a magic pot of gold hidden somewhere way out of sight, where loans and mortgages are easy to get, and where banks almost want to pay you to borrow money. Where things are good, at least good if you're in the right socioeconomic class. Then there are the hard times, the moments when even those with good creditworthiness can't get credit, the times where interest rates continue to rise, where banks and governments and small family businesses worry about how that next bill is going to get paid, where things are bad for most and impossible for those in the wrong socioeconomic class. As many economists agree, we're likely heading for some tough times ahead. Interest rates are going up, companies are laying off staff, and investment money that was once easy to obtain is becoming increasingly difficult for companies to secure. And in the EV world, we're about to see the biggest bubble pop I think we've seen in recent memory. It's about to get messy. As in a previous video that touched on financial things, I want to reiterate here that I'm not a financial advisor, nor do I pretend to be one here on YouTube. And while I know there are people who watch this channel and use some of what we say here to make their own financial investments, because you've told me as much, please do not treat this video as financial advice. You are on your own for any actions you take as a consequence of watching this video. That out of the way, let's deal with what we're going to cover in today's video. Namely the fact that as the global economy starts to take a turn for the worst, we're going to see more and more startup automakers drop out of the running and into the history books. But as I'm about to explain, it's not just financially unexpected times ahead, it's economic uncertainty combined with the one thing that most startups can't compete with. Larger, better funded competition from mainstream automakers. So today I'm going to examine what lies ahead for the bubble that's about to burst in the EV world, explain why this time is different to previous times we've seen EV industry layoffs, and ask if the end is near for punky startups who desperately want to be the next Tesla. Let's start with a little history refresher. At the time of the Great Recession, 2007 through 2009, or roughly thereabouts, the electric vehicle market was a very different place. Tesla was a scrappy little startup with plans to bring an electric roadster to market. Aptera was still talking about bringing a plug-in hybrid and all-electric two-series three-wheeler to market. And a slew of custom boutique EV specialists and low-speed vehicle manufacturers jostled for attention on what was, frankly, a tiny market stage. The Great Recession did two things. It made investors less eager to fund startups on a whim, regardless of what they were promising, and it made the cost of continuing development harder. Many smaller scale EV companies, especially those with quirky or low speed models, simply ceased to exist. The original Aptera folded in 2011, partly because of the poor management from its then CEO Paul Wilbur, who had taken over leadership from the original co-founders of the company in 2008, and partly because funding dried up. As a company developing three rather than four-wheeled vehicles, it was deemed ineligible for low-interest loans under the terms of the federal government's Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Loan Program. Many other companies which had promised electric or high-mileage vehicles had met a similar fate, and only a handful of startups actually survived. Let's not forget, too, that at one point during the Great Recession, Elon Musk was draining his own bank account to keep Tesla in business. It was only a well-timed $50 million investment from Daimler, 
at Mercedes-Benz in 2009 that helped Tesla keep afloat and later on gave Daimler and then Toyota, who also invested in Tesla, a way to sell limited production vehicles that were built with Tesla technology rather than in-house technology. Had those two investments not happened, Tesla might not have survived to reach a point where it was able to take out an ATVM loan, which it then paid back in full, early. But it wasn't just startups that suffered either during the Great Recession. The US federal government saved the US auto industry, with only Ford not taking federal aid to stay afloat. And... The same ATVM loan program that Aptera didn't qualify for and that helped Tesla bring the Model S to market also helped Nissan build batteries for its Leaf Electric hatchback and helped Chevrolet build the Volt. In short, the last time we had a major financial crisis, even large automakers needed help and only the most plucky of startups survive. Fast forward to today, Tesla is the world's largest electric automaker by volume. It's one of the world's most valuable companies. It has undergone incredible growth and despite the controversy around full self-driving and Elon Musk's recent Twitter distractions, it's a far more stable and powerful position today than it was 14 years ago. That success has prompted mainstream automakers to play catch up. Every single mid- and large-volume automaker already makes and sells some form of electric vehicle. Sure, there are holdouts. Toyota comes to mind here. But even Toyota is working to accelerate its electric vehicle strategy and has multiple electric vehicles on sale around the world. For clarity here, lest people think I'm smoking something, I am talking global markets, not specific markets. Then there's been a major change in world attitudes towards electric vehicles. Fifteen years ago, electric vehicles were quirky things that only environmentalists and weirdos drove, at least from the perspective of your average consumer. And I say that, by the way, as someone who has been driving electric vehicles for nearly 18 years, and most certainly is a weirdo. Back then, some forward-thinking governments did offer some perks for EV ownership, but nowhere near the incentives and perks that you can get for buying one today. What's more, the last time we had a global recession, the auto industry didn't have a clear mandate from world governments to make the switch to electric vehicles. Sure, they may have been under pressure to improve their gas mileage and their emissions, but not the planned ban on sale of all new internal combustion engine vehicles that now exist in many markets. It would be naive, of course, to assume that these bans are set in stone. We're already seeing some governments who had agreed on blanket ICE bans starting to backtrack their promises. Germany, I'm looking at you. World governments change and traditionally they shift as a consequence of citizens blaming large world events on their own elected officials. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. So let's talk about the change at legacy automakers and the resulting change in investor behaviour. This time around, instead of the only EV companies in town being plucky startups, we're seeing large multinational automakers throw their 9,000 plus pound weight around like, well, a 9,000 pound trophy truck. And these companies, while they may have less money to spare than you might think, are reacting differently to how they acted last time we were heading towards financial uncertainty. They're streamlining their production lines and their product portfolios. They're simplifying their technology platforms. And sadly, they're laying off staff or asking them to take voluntary separation in order to shore up the coffers to fund the shift to electric and stay afloat. They're using their profits from internal combustion engine vehicle sales to fund EV, autonomous and connected vehicle development programs. And in some cases, they're spinning off subsidiaries that can behave like startups, but come back home to live with mum and dad if, you know, things get a bit tough. Or if you're feeling more morbid, those companies can unalive without affecting the parent company. And here is where things get 
really interesting because companies that have a history of going back decades and startups spun off from an established brand have much more chance of gaining investor money in tough financial times than a brand new startup with a few successful funding rounds underneath its belt. At least, those companies are more likely to gain institutional investment money. Institutional investors who are happy to wait decades for their rewards to come aren't looking to get rich quick in the same way that a day trader or even a retail trader might. Retail traders are more likely to invest in a quirky startup for sure, but only if that company is doing something unique and different. And their investments are much smaller, meaning you need an order of magnitude more retail traders to jump on the bandwagon to keep a small startup afloat than you would need in terms of institutional investment. In a recession, it's also less likely that a large number of retail investors will be ready and willing to take a punt than they would during a more positive economic time. Which brings me to the final points I want to make. EV market forces are different today than they were in the last recession. I think by now you probably know we've got limited global resources of raw materials for EV battery packs, motors and microprocessors. Not necessarily because there's a limited supply in the ground, but because mining, refining and producing those components takes a lot of skill, time and money. There's a reason why so many large automakers, including Tesla, are trying to establish their own mining, refining and battery production facilities. 15 years ago, startups wanting to bring EVs to market had to compete for parts and raw materials with other startups. They all wanted to do the same thing, but they were in small volume. Today, those same companies are competing with large multinational companies whose lines of credit, cash on hand and general liquidity totally eclipses anything even the best funded startup can offer. And when economies of scale come into play, both in terms of contract value and cost to produce vehicles, the majority of startups just do not have a chance. A large multinational legacy automaker making EVs will be able to do it more quickly and for less cost than a startup, even if that startup has more innovative, impressive or revolutionary technology. And that's before you even acknowledge that legacy automakers have existing sales and service teams ready to go, which no startup today has. We've already seen multiple companies either change direction or declare bankruptcy outright or head towards uncertain terms. Lightyear and Sono Motors come to mind, with the latter shifting its attention to selling its solar technology to other automakers rather than selling cars direct to customers. Others, like Rivian and Lucid, have seen their share price tumble as they struggle to reach break-even point and meet their own production goals. And some, like Lordstown, appear to be putting on a pretty big spin on what appears to be pretty dire issues with production line pauses. In all three of these cases, these car companies are also directly competing against models from much larger firms with deeper pockets, firms like Tesla, Ford and Mercedes-Benz. Will anyone survive? Can Quirky save startup? Honestly, I'm not sure. Akimoto, which recently raised $12 million in extra revenue through a discounted stock sale, seems to be okay for now, but... I'm certainly not going to bet on it being around in a few years' time in its current form. And the reborn Aptera, whose vehicle is completely different from anything we've seen in the market before, is pushing forward to raise the last bit of capital it needs to reach smash production. Both companies do have quirky on their side, and in the case of Aptera, the claim of being the most efficient and innovative vehicle from an energy efficiency standpoint and one that you may not even ever have to plug in. For early adopters and fans like myself, that is definitely a draw. But for regular car buyers who, like institutional investors, are cautious of change, I remain very unconvinced they'll bite. 
the last time we were here, many EV startups couldn't compete with internal combustion engine vehicles from mainstream automakers. The EV industry was too much in its infancy for most to survive. And the most convincing company, basically Tesla, attracted all of the investment dollars that was available. Now, investors are split between many, many disparate startups, young companies, and to some extent, legacy automakers. What's more, those investors are facing higher risks and as a consequence, demand more for their time and their money, which in turn squeezes those smaller startups. For the high risk of investing in an EV startup, those investors today want their pound of flesh and more. And this time around, the auto industry's acceptance of EVs is established enough that EVs themselves will continue to be made and sold by the companies that can afford to make them and offer their customers a good deal and a really good warranty. But for the rest of them, into the blue again, after the money's gone, once in a lifetime, water flowing underground. If you like this video, you know what to do and feel free to tip us with a super thanks. The comments are not open for your thoughts because, well, you, you probably know we had to close our comments section for reasons, but you are more than welcome in our Discord chat room, link below, or if you are a Patreon supporter in our Patreon pages. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to Kofi, Bitcoin and Swag Store and check us out on Mastodon. We have our very own server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters. Mike Weida, Tony Moss, Linda Irish, Sean Tucker, Patrick Boyarski, Paul Nelson, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Moore Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tesla Nagong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Ascentar, and Jim Burness. Finally, out of this world thanks to our top tier supporters, Robert Flannery, CPU Freak 101, Andrew Glenn, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Barrowbridge, Dave Kitchen, Aaron Hahn, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. I also want to thank those of you who signed up this week who may not be in our list yet. That doesn't mean we're not grateful for your support because believe me, we are. You've made life here so much better this week. I promise that we'll get your names on the list as soon as possible. I, Kate, or someone else from the team will be back soon with more videos, but until then, keep evolving. I hope you stuck around for my vintage Mac section. Today, this machine is not actually operating behind me. It does function. It is obviously a Power Mac G4 Cube, one of the icons of Apple design history. I do not have a monitor to go with it. And so I did not want to put a big, horrible modern monitor on screen so that you could see it working. It does work. It needs a new hard drive, which I'm about to put in and stick around until Monday because I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about this uh, Mac Cube that you're not going to believe, basically, about connections between this machine, where I picked it up from in Bath, the UK, and my old music college. So keep your eyes peeled on Monday.